Hey, it's JB and welcome to the channel. Today is Carlos Santana's 75th birthday. So to celebrate this milestone in the life of one of my greatest musical heroes and influences and mentors, really, I thought it would be cool to share with you a few personal recollections from my times working with him and, you know, absorbing his energy and his wisdom and so on and so forth. Most of you will know that Santana, the band and the man, had a huge impact on the world of music by combining rock with Latin as well as with soul and R&B, blues, uh, jazz, and world music of all different kinds over the last 50 plus years, which is just incredible to think about. But they also had a really huge impact on me personally, which is what I want to share with you. And it happened in a few different phases. The first was when I rediscovered their music at about the age of 16 and started really listening to Abraxas as a budding musician and guitar player. You know, I had heard that music my whole life, but it just meant something completely different when I was thinking about music as a life path. And that album actually opened me up and gave me more of a global consciousness about music, which I'm sure it did for millions of other people too. The second thing was when I started traveling a lot and I was in various parts of Latin America. I traveled a ton in Mexico and I was in Venezuela and uh, Panama and uh, Guyana and Belize and Guatemala. And during all of those travels, Santana's early 70s sort of jazz fusion influence period was the soundtrack of all of that. I'm talking about Caravanserai, uh, Welcome, Lotus. It also dovetailed perfectly with a kind of period of spiritual search that I was going through. It really resonated with me and informed what I was experiencing in my early 20s. And the third and biggest one was when I actually got a chance to play with Santana and eventually even work on their albums. So there was a period there where I had a lot of interaction with Santana and it was, you know, they were heady times because we were making uh, really important records for him. And I was in there as a producer, as a songwriter, sometimes as an engineer, <laughs> Uh, and even as a guitar player and a vocalist, I got to work with Carlos and the band. And you could say I'm something of a fan. To go from that to being a collaborator, it's hard to describe what that journey was like, but you can probably just imagine. So one of the things I've realized is that these experiences were so rich and I learned so much from their music, both as a fan and as a collaborator, that I want to share it on this YouTube channel. So you're going to be seeing a lot of Santana related content coming up. Carlos's unique guitar style and his sound and his gear. I want to get into all that stuff. I want to talk about the original lineup of Santana, which I consider to be one of the true great classic lineups in rock history, especially Mike Shreve, the drummer I want to talk to. And I also want to share some of the music that I got to make with Santana so we can get into all that stuff in the future. So if you're a Santana fan, this channel is going to be kind of like the place to be. But first, I want to share some of these little anecdotes. Carlos, if you're out there watching this, I don't know if you're going to remember this stuff as well as I do, but you'll probably get a kick out of it regardless. So the first one was the first time that I met Carlos. I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I was on the road with war and I found out Santana was playing on the same night and I had just enough time to catch the first half of their show before rushing back and being on stage in time for my gig. Now, because of road managers being friends with each other and stuff like that, I found a way to get backstage and meet Carlos. And immediately when he found out that I was playing with war, he kind of latched onto that and he said, that's a great gig. I said, why is that? He said, because in war, you have to play all different kinds of music. You have to play the funk. You got to play Latin. You got to play the reggae. He said, that's how it is in my band. That's how Santana is. We play it all. And he said, that's a huge experience for you and a really good gig for you as a guitar player. So I thought that was really cool kind of encouragement coming from him the first time meeting him. And then he proceeded to go out on stage and melt faces 
until I had to rush back to my own show. The second time was when we were recording some of the music that would become Supernatural, his big comeback album of 2000, that era. We were in the middle of cutting tracks and stuff, and we took a break, and I was standing in a basketball court behind the studio with Carlos. I said, Carlos, can I get something off my chest? And he said, what do you got? And he was holding a basketball. And I said, it's a little awkward for me, because in a position of being a producer, I have to try and push you as an artist for the benefit of the music. And, you know, it, there's going to be moments when I have to say things like, you know, Carlos, I think you got a better take in you, you know, and it gets real right in the studio. That's just how it is. And I said, and in reality, all I really want is to sit down and just, you know, get a guitar lesson from you. <laughs> so how am I supposed to do my job? And keep in mind, I was in my 20s and I was very transparent with my feelings and thoughts. He said, all of the decisions that you've ever made and that I've ever made and all of the chances and circumstances and, you know, miracles and whatever else that's ever happened in our lives led us up to this moment right here, right now, talking to each other in this basketball court. He said, who are you to question that, JB? Who are you to doubt at this moment that is the result of the cumulative experiences of the whole rest of your life. You can't question that, he said. So produce me. And he gave me the basketball. <laughs> it was just perfect. And then he goes, to illustrate this, he said, if we're in the studio and you're trying to communicate a concept to me, just sing it to me and I'll try and play it. And if I don't play it right, he said, take the guitar and play it. And then I'll see if I can play it. And he said, and if I still can't play it, then tell me, Carlos, that was perfect. And then you go record it after I leave. So that just shows you the kind of atmosphere he was trying to create for that music and the kind of, you know, encouragement that he was giving me as a young producer working with one of his heroes. So the next time was a few years later, we're working on a different record and we had this song called One of These Days. And uh, we brought in Oso Motley to play on the track. They put horns and vocals and guitars and bass and everything. And I threw down a demo vocal for Carlos to hear the lyrics. And the guys in Oso Motley were in the control room, like egging me on. And they were saying into the mic, you know, sing it like a man. You know, it was that kind of atmosphere. So the vocal ended up being pretty good vocal and, and I was happy with it, you know, as a representation of the song. And we took it to Carlos and we were playing it for him. And I was imagining what, you know, rock star, or pop star we were going to put on the song. Maybe Seal would have been great. Maybe Ziggy Marley or maybe even Femi Kuti or one of the, one of the, you know, one of the sons of Fela Kuti that the song was sort of a tribute to. And Carlos said, I like it just the way it is with my voice on it. And I looked over at Casey Porter. Casey Porter was co-producing and co-writing all these sessions. So he knew everything. And I looked over at Casey and, and he kind of went like this, like, don't say anything. And he was doing this, like Carlos likes it. <laughs> and I, so I was about to say something and then I saw Casey doing that. So when, if you go back and listen to the song, one of these days, it's got, that's my vocal on it because, um, because he said, let's leave it alone. Another one was during those sessions, Carlos had borrowed this amp, which was sort of the ultimate holy grail of guitar amplifiers. It was a Dumble Overdrive Special. You guitar players out there know exactly what that is. They're like the unobtainium of guitar. You can't find them, you can't afford them, and you know, it's a lot of hype and a lot of lore and everything. And Carlos had introduced me to Howard. Alexander Dumble on several different occasions. I got to meet him. I got to talk with him. But this was the amp itself, right? And Carlos went home for the night and he said, why don't you go in there and play through that amp? And the only guitars that were there were all of his main guitars that we were using for the session. And he goes, yeah, just, you know, go in there and just take your time and play any of those guitars. And he leaves. 
And I went in and just played Carlos's main guitar through the legendary Dumble Overdrive special for I don't know how long. I probably spent about 45 minutes just shamelessly playing every Santana lick that I ever learned and having the time of my life. And that amplifier sounded so good that I can still almost kind of feel it in my hands and the way it resonated. I swear to God, the thing was everything that it was cracked up to be and then some. Why would he let me in there to do that? I really have no idea, but that's what he did. Another one, this is kind of a side note, and then I'll tell you the last anecdote. Carlos really has a lot of respect for people's uh, spiritual journeys and commitments and the paths that they're on. And he loved the fact that Casey and I were members of the Baha'i faith. So he used to ask us all kinds of questions, have these really deep conversations about the Baha'i faith and about all things spiritual. Well, one of the interesting things that I noticed is that he always found a way to work that into conversations in the most random moments. Like one time he introduced me to an actor that I admire, which is, you know, you, you admire too. Eddie Olmos, Edward James Olmos. And somehow he managed to work Baha'i into that conversation. And I was just like, wow, he really, he really honors that side of me. Like he wants to, he kind of wants to bring that into it, even at moments when I definitely wouldn't, you know? And one time he even found a Baha'i book in a bookstore somewhere and bought it and signed it uh, with his family and <laughs> sent it to me. So he really kind of keyed in on that aspect of things too and heavily encouraged it. And you'll notice that encouragement is kind of the overarching theme here. So the last one I want to share with you is, is, is a real bombshell. Carlos calls me once and asks me to come down to the Hollywood Bowl and sing that song one of these days with the band on stage. So obviously I went and brought my entire family. But I went over there, I got on stage, I sang the song. Oso Motley was opening the show, so all the Oso Motley guys were there, and they, they had played on the track. There was like 20 of us on stage. I didn't even play guitar, I just sang the song. And we got off, and at the end of the show, Carlos took me aside in the backstage at the Hollywood Bowl, you know, and this is the most legendary venue imaginable, right? Everybody, the Beatles have played at the Hollywood Bowl. It's just, you know, crazy. So he takes me aside backstage and he goes, let me ask you something. I said, okay. He goes, how long did you guys work on that song? And I said, honestly, about a month, maybe even five weeks, you know, off and on, we put a ton of energy into it and a lot of recorded a ton of musicians on it. He said, he goes, that's what I thought. He said, how long did I work on it? And I, I didn't really know where he was going with this. I said, well, you know, that one night in Berkeley at Fantasy Studios, you laid your guitar down and that was it. Right. He said, who sang it? I did, sir. You know, <laughs> he goes, who produced it? I was like, Casey and I produced it. Okay. Who wrote it? I said, we wrote it. He goes, whose name is on the front? And I said, yours, you know, is for your album. He said, do you see the problem with that? And uh, I didn't, I still didn't really understand. He said, I came in for one night after you worked on this for a month and my name is on it. He said, I appreciate all that hard work, but you need to stop doing that. You need to step out and come into that artistic voice and stop hiding behind guys like me. Coming from Santana, that was a pretty huge deal. As you can see, the kind of big theme here was encouragement. You know, there's a generosity of spirit behind all of these stories. And it was really about him encouraging someone a whole generation younger than him that he didn't know for a long time and just making a lot of space for me and trying to encourage me to just really just spread my wings and be the guy. He even said that, you know, be the guy. <laughs> so that was 
uh, you know, just a smattering of these experiences that I had. There are a lot more. I'm sure I'll think of more down the line for other videos, but this is just a really nice way for me to remember um, Carlos on his birthday. And happy 75th, Carlos. I know you're still going strong. You still have a lot to say. You're still out there tearing it up every night on the road and having a very happy life with Cindy. And I just wish you all the best. And we all do. And we value you so much, man. So that's all I got for now. I'll see you guys in the next video. Onwards.